So it's very appropriate and, and useful that I go right after Guy Claxton. Guy kind of ended his talk, and at the, the end there was talking about the importance of culture. And what I'm going to be talking about is how is it that we create cultures of thinking. And so specifically um, this afternoon in this session, there are kind of three big questions that I want to explore with you. And the first one is beginning to unpack this notion about what is a culture of thinking. And the second very related question is, why does that matter? So why should we care about schools being cultures of thinking? And the third question, again, very much related to that, is instead of thinking about culture, because when we talk about a group culture, an organizational culture, the culture of a classroom, the culture of a school, it's easy for us to kind of think, well, there's a mysteriousness about that. That culture just kind of grows up. So I want to explore with you how is it that we can better understand, how is it that we can assess, how is it that we can form and shape that culture. To put all of this work in a little bit of context, um, I want to kind of share you briefly kind of where these ideas come from. So back in 1998, the Spencer Foundation funded my research in classrooms of teachers who were very, very adept at getting students to think, at developing their habits of mind, developing their thinking dispositions. So I spent a year in these classrooms of these kind of amazing teachers. And in analyzing that, what I saw was these teachers really leveraged the culture to develop those dispositions. They didn't have special lessons. They, you know, didn't kind of do a lot of very deliberate things, and yet, Everything was deliberate, everything was focused in understanding culture. So that's where this framework um, that I've been using ever since came from. And then um, that got written about in the book Intellectual Character. And, and then we took that idea, one of those ideas actually, that the teachers were using. And these excellent teachers were constantly leveraging and creating routines. And we took that idea and developed the thinking routines, which we talked about in a panel this morning about visible thinking, and took that idea also to the work in Australia, funded by Bialik College, that got written about in the book Making Thinking Visible. And most recently, all of these ideas have kind of come together in a new book called Creating Cultures of Thinking, but it's been a very long line of research to kind of get me there. So to help us explore why we should care about culture, I'd like for you to think for a minute about, to my mind, what is the most fundamental question in education? It's a question that I would ask every minister of education, every policymaker, um, every principal, every teacher, every parent. And that question is, what do we want the students we teach to be like as adults? Do you take a minute and just think about that question? What do we want the children we teach to be like as adults? Would you quickly turn to your neighbor and just share what kind of came to mind when you thought about those questions? Okay, and we'll come back together here. Now, it's quite possible that in answering that question um, and responding to it yourself, your responses were very similar um, to perhaps what Guy Claxton was talking about earlier. Um, perhaps some of these words came to mind. Perhaps some ideas that, that Howard Gardner talked about yesterday or David Perkins. We often refer to these kinds of things as dispositions. We hear other people talking about them now as sometimes 21st century skills, sometimes you know, soft skills, lots of different ways that they are talked about. But my favorite way of actually describing what these things are comes from 
um, a former dean of Harvard Graduate um, School of Education, who used to talk about these things as the residuals of education. And I think that's a really, really powerful framing. Because if you kind of remember from long division, a residual is what's left over. It's a remainder. It's what stays behind. And to my mind, that is really the mark of what a quality school is. What is it that stays behind? So what is it that stays with our students? One year out, two years out, three years out of the classroom, what is it that's going to stay with them? It's been estimated that there's a half-life of knowledge and skills which aren't used and reinforced of only about six months. So that means we can learn something if we aren't using that material, if we aren't constantly calling up that knowledge, about half of it will go away in six months, and then another half, and another half. So thinking about what is it that's going to stay with students, we have kind of created this game of school in which for all of the focus kind of worldwide on tests and accountability, we actually don't have a lot of evidence that our teaching makes much of a difference because we teach kids something and we test them right away. Every secondary or even middle school teacher knows, you know, you're teaching a unit before the test, what do you do? You stop teaching, you review everything you've just taught, you give kids a study guide, they go home and then they take the test the next day. Every student and every teacher knows the performance on that test wouldn't be the same two weeks later. So we teach very fragile knowledge and very fragile skills. So think about what is it that is going to stay with our students. I mean, imagine how our teaching would be different if this coming school year, you were not allowed to give your students any tests or quizzes. But instead, your children had to come back to your classroom the following year to sit all of your exams and quizzes. It would fundamentally change the way that we teach, to teach for the long haul, to teach for these kinds of residuals. However, when we look at any of these things up here, none of them can be directly taught. You can't teach a six-week unit on curiosity. And then, bam, at the end of six weeks, we'll give you a test, we'll figure out exactly how curious you are. You know, this will determine your placement next year, whether you get to go to you know, Curiosity A or Curiosity B or Curiosity Enrichment. You know, that wouldn't make any sense. So if we care about these things, and they can't be directly taught, the next now logical question that we need to ask ourselves is, so how will schools help students to get there? And the quick answer to that is enculturation. And enculturation means to learn through the culture, the culture of the group one is in. My favorite way of kind of explaining what that word is comes from a very famous quote from the Russian psychologist Vygotsky. And Vygotsky said, children grow into the intellectual life around them. So to think about what kind of intellectual life are we surrounding our students with? What are we allowing them to kind of grow into. Another way of thinking about what enculturation is, is enculturation is a process of kind of sending messages. So what are the messages that students are receiving in our classrooms and in our schools? What are they learning about learning, about how that happens? Another key part about internalizing those messages is about consistency. So what are the messages that they receive over and over again? That's what's going to kind of really be reinforced. So if, if I take this message, or if I take this kind of metaphor of messages and push that metaphor just a little bit further, we could say that enculturation is actually a form of storytelling. That we are telling a story to our students, a story about learning, and we are constantly telling that story. So I want to spend some time with us kind of exploring this notion of the story of learning that we're telling our students. And a very good place to start with thinking about the story is to think about the old story, the story that we were told when we were students in school. Made on your weekly mathematics test. More than half of you failed. 
Most of those who passed just got by. Nobody had 100%. This is the poorest class I've had in a long, long time. Most of you have no foundation at all. Now, the trouble's with your attitude. You don't pay enough attention in class. You don't do enough work outside of it. You don't know what the word study means. You haven't the slightest idea. Don't you realize that mathematics is an important subject? I tell you right now that unless you get over your lazy habits and come up to the standards I've set for this class, many of you will have the pleasure of repeating this course next semester. Well, what is it? Okay, now I know not everyone in the room is old enough to have attended a black and white classroom. Um, a few of us are. But regardless of when and where you went to school, you were sent messages. You were sent messages about what it means to be smart, what it means to succeed, how one learns, what school is, what school is all about. Again, could you turn to the person sitting next to you and share with them, what were some of those messages that you were sent as a student in school? Okay, once again, we'll come back together here. Now, if we were in a little closer space here where it'd be a little bit easier to hear, I'd love to kind of collect some of these stories from you. Um, instead, I'm going to kind of share what tends to be a really dominant theme and to see if this kind of corresponds, you know, to some of the messages that you were sent. Um, and I'll ask for just kind of people to raise their hands. So how many people were sent messages in school about that learning is about being fast with a quick right answer? So several people that. And how many people were sent messages that school is largely about sorting, of determining who's smart and who isn't, and putting people in order? Okay. And how many people were sent messages in school that the economy of school is all about the grades? That's how you keep score and know where you're at. So those are very, very kind of dominant messages that were there. And in fact, many of those messages continue to be dominant in school today. And instead of telling a story of learning, what's often told is really a story of work. And there are lots of reasons about why this is so, and I'll explore kind of how that story of work winds up um, kind of manifesting itself. But think about, are these some of the messages that you were sent when you were a student. And so, again, those messages may echo back to us when we were students. However, a lot of those messages still really dominate in schools today. And if you wonder about, do your students have this perception that school is all about work, a good place to look and to pay attention are the questions your students ask. So do your students ask these kinds of questions? Do any of those sound familiar? Yeah. So those are pretty common questions, and they're actually kind of quite legitimate questions for students to be asking when the focus is on the work. And they're telling us that that's where students are placing their attention. 
And if we think about where this story and how this story gets so embedded, there are several places we can look. First of all, we can kind of look historically, and that schools as we know them kind of grew out of the effort to end child labor around the world. And so school was originally sold to society, to parents, as children's work. And we have that metaphor of work really built in from the outset. And we also then have a language of work. Seat work, work periods, work time, homework, get to work. That word work just kind of rolls off our tongue as it embedded in many different ways. And in fact, um, one of the, the bits of data from um, Guy Claxton's work is a teacher researcher sitting in the back of classrooms counting how many times teachers use the word work versus learning. And it was something like 49 times to one. So that language of work really permeates us. And then students' perceptions tend to dominate and dominate about classrooms being places of work. Um, a researcher at San Francisco State University, Hermione Marshall, has done a lot of research in this area, and she found that students overwhelmingly, in about 75% of classrooms that she looked at, she could characterize as being work-oriented classrooms versus only about 20, 25% being learning-oriented classrooms. So students and parents, too, often have this notion that school is work. So parents are used to being monitors of their work. They're used to asking their child, they come home, well, what's your homework? What do you have to do? So they, they reinforce this message about work. When I talk to parent groups, one of the things I tell them is, you can help your child focus on the learning by adding one additional question. So instead of only asking, What's your homework? What do you have to do? Ask that additional question of, and what is it that you think your teacher wants you to learn from that? Helping to refocus the student on the learning. Another place that we can see this notion of work is in grading policies. And quite frequently, it's very common that if we have a student, if we have a student that we know fully understands the material, but that student has not done all of the work, has not been compliant, has not turned everything in, then we feel like we have to punish that student in terms of their grade. And then by the same token, if we have a student that doesn't understand as well, but is willing to do extra work, we kind of give that child um, an added bump in their grade. So our grades are not really reflecting a true level of understanding. There's an effort now, um, kind of around the world, to think about standards-based grading, to make sure that our grades really reflect the level of understanding of students rather than merely about their work. Now, often when I talk about this notion about work and learning, a, a lot of kind of tension comes up, and a lot of people say, well, yes, but of course, don't we want students to develop a work ethic? Well, of course we do but we want them to persist for a purpose. And a big distinction between work and learning is largely a distinction about purpose. So if you are doing it for someone else, if you are doing it for the grade, if you are doing it only for the eyes of your teacher, it's likely to feel like work. But if you see the value in it, if you see the purpose, if you see how it contributes to your understanding, if it has what I call perceived worth in the eyes of the learner, then it's going to feel much more like learning. So we've looked at kind of that old story, we've looked at a big part of the current story. One other story we have to watch out for that's present for way too many students is a story of alienation. And those messages look something like this. Now, the problem with this story of alienation is it begins to separate the learner from the learning process. And in the worst cases, a story of alienation winds up being separating um, the student from the whole process of schooling. What is more common is that students are going to experience a sense of alienation from a particular subject area. So they may gradually come to see, ah, mathematics is not for me. 
I'm no good at writing. I just can't do sport. So we have to make sure as teachers that we aren't alienating our students from the very subjects and the very learning we want for them. So how is it that we make them feel a part of that as well? So we want to turn our attention now to think about what is the new story? What's the story of learning then that we really want to be telling our students? So we're going to take a look at a video here, and after we watch this video, I'm going to ask you to talk to the people around you about what do you think are some of the messages that students in this classroom are receiving. So you could walk into any classroom, and in any classroom you can ask yourself, well, what are students learning here? And that could very well be a question about content, about what's the lesson all about. But in every classroom, we can also ask the question, what are students learning about learning here. That's kind of the meta curriculum. So we can always ask that question and always look kind of with that second lens at what are students learning. So as we look at this classroom, we're going to ask you to think about, well, what are the students in this classroom learning about learning? This video comes from a class um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, the class is a student of native Spanish speakers. And the class is a science class at the middle school level um, conducted in Spanish. The teacher will be doing some narration in English, but the students will be speaking in Spanish. Um, there will be subtitles there in English as well. My goal for this unit was basically for them to be able to explore different kinds of variables. Some, some are independent, some are dependent, for them to have a hands-on experience with how to do an experiment. Also, another goal was to be able to express themselves and communicate their ideas. If they're able to verbalize it, then they really own it. Okay. La semana pasada estuvieron siendo experimento, ¿verdad? Con la pregunta que tenía. ¿Se recuerdan de eso? Okay. Entonces van a hablar o escribir sobre el diseño de un experimento que hicieron o la pregunta que tienen. ¿Cuál la pregunta? Otra vez. La pregunta. ¿Cómo va a ser el movimiento del oscilador con otros materiales? Y cuando estamos mirando los diferentes materiales, ¿qué estamos mirando? I want them to reach higher level of thinking. I want them to be able to communicate with one another in their native language. I want them to be able to do reflections, and hypotheses, conclusions. When it becomes a second language, there's a lot more barriers and becomes more difficult for them. It can happen. I mean, you can do it, but the way that you would do it would be differently and it would take a longer time. ¿Cómo tú vas a poner eso en la pregunta ahora? ¿Cómo va a, ser, cómo va a cambiar el peso del lápiz? No, uh, Sin el centavo porque estaban mirando el peso. Y hay que no. mirar las dos cosas porque no me va a entender. Si sí, el peso afecta la velocidad. Si sí, el, sí, el peso afecta, no la velocidad, pero el número. Si sí, el peso afecta el peso. Y el número de ciclos. El número de ciclos, sí. porque tú no estabas. Yo no, yo no sé si tú te fijaste en la velocidad o si tú estabas mirando el número de ciclos. So, lo que vamos a hacer es. Van a subir poquito a poquito y bueno, las personas que están listas van a presentar los datos que ellos tienen. ¿Ok? Bueno, estaba probando los osciladores aquí. Y nuestra pregunta es que para mantener los ciclos, ¿cuánto cor cuál, ¿cuán corto puede ser el oscilador? El algo mínimo. Eh, nuestro propósito es encontrar cuál es el mínimo largo del hilo que se pueda para que pueda dar ciclo. Y cuando nosotros llegamos a, a un centímetro de largo, el, el, el hilo no pudo seguir como era bien pequeño y la moneda tenía más peso. Y sí. cuando daba vuelta, eh, daba primero vuelta, bien rápido, pero después paraba. Entonces, a veces, si aquí hay 23, se, se queda por los 23, no sube a los 30. Y aquí vemos que cuando va de alto, va mal paso, ¿no es verdad? Pero cuando va bajando los centímetros, Viene yendo más rápido y da más ciclo, pero si lo bajan demasiado con un centímetro, no va a poder, va a parar, porque está rápido que va, va a parar. Que yo digo como, wow, porque nosotros no llegamos a tratar eso, porque antes, cuando hicimos este experimento, nosotros lo hicimos con poco, y lo único que vimos fue que daba más rápido, pero no vimos cuando, con cuántos centímetros era que paraba. 
to me today, they sounded like they were scientists. They really knew what they were talking about, about variables and their presentation, the way they were able to do an experiment, reflect, reflect upon an experiment, describe it, and come to a conclusion. Um, I'm very pleased with them. Entonces, eh, nuestra pregunta es, ¿cómo el peso afecta el número de ciclos en un oscilador? Pusimos el lápiz pegado al escritorio, no muy adentro, con tape. Después eh, pusimos como 50 centímetros de largo del hilo y lo atamos al lápiz pegado al escritorio. Y después medimos el tiempo con un reloj a ver cuántas oscilaciones hace en 15, en 15 segundos, 20 segundos, 25 segundos, 30 segundos y 35 segundos. Cuando estaba haciendo las oscilaciones, ¿Usó otra clase de, de peso? Sí. ¿Cómo? Usamos los sujeta papeles acá y lo, y lo pusimos de distinta forma también. Lo pusimos pega, como juntos porque antes lo habíamos hecho a lo largo y ahora lo pusimos juntos. Entonces, y pusimos tres sujeta papeles. Bien. ¿Ustedes ca eh, dejaron la misma cantidad de hilo o cambiaron? No, la misma. Oh. Lo que me, me gustó de esto fue que Anteriormente, cuando hicimos este experimento, no estaba muy claro si era el peso o la longitud. Y lo que ahora tú nos dices, sí, nos sí. confirme. Uh -huh. Ok, so would you take two minutes and with the people sitting next to you, um, talk and discuss what do you think some of the messages that students were receiving in this classroom? What were some of the things they were learning about learning here? Okay, and once again, we'll come back together here. So as we think about these messages, and again, if we were in a much smaller room, it'd be great to kind of hear what people are thinking, what are some of the things that you've identified here. As our research team, we've kind of looked at what are some core messages that we want to make sure that we're sending. And I think most of these messages are present in this classroom. So this isn't meant to be an exclusive list, but just some of the things that we think are really important. So the first one comes from David Perkins. And one of the lines that he has said that has always stuck with me is that learning is a consequence or a product of thinking. So we want our students to understand that thinking isn't something we do as an extra. It's not something we do kind of on the side but that our learning occurs as a result of our thinking. And in addition for this message being really important for our students, this is also a really important message for teachers. Because most of us as teachers were trained in the delivery of content. And yet, today that content is out there. Learning doesn't occur when someone delivers content for you. Learning occurs when you do something with that content. And so as teachers, we need to go beyond thinking about how is it that we divide up that content? How is it we will deliver that content on so many days over so many weeks to what is the thinking that I want my students to be doing with that content? The second message there is for students to recognize that learning and thinking are as much a collective endeavor as they are an individual enterprise. So we want this strong connection
between the individual and the group. When we saw students in that video learning together, questioning one another, the group is able to push and prod you to advance your thinking, to press you to think, so to recognize the importance of the group there. The third um, kind of key message is we want students to understand that learning occurs at the point of challenge. Many students run away from challenges. You know, they don't want to do something hard. And yet a theme that keeps popping up over and over again um, from many of the speakers already at this conference and from a long line of research is that it is that point of challenge where students really begin to learn. Carol Dweck's work talking about the importance of having a growth mindset, of recognizing that we learn, we grow, our intelligence develops, our brain develops through the challenges we face. So we don't want our students running away from those challenges, we want them embracing that. And as teachers, this notion that learning occurs at the point of challenge goes to the heart of what differentiated instruction is all about. The differentiated instruction is not designing um, an activity, one activity for this group, one for this group, one for this group. But differentiated um, learning and instruction is really about finding that point of challenge for all learners. And one way to think about this is to think about that every learning opportunity that we create has to have a low threshold, meaning that students can easily walk and enter into that space. At the same time, it needs to have a high ceiling so that students can stretch and can take their learning as far as possible. However, so many things that happen in school have a low ceiling, and students will only work up to that ceiling, and then they'll stop. That's when we get those questions, you know, how long does this have to be? How many points is this worth? What exactly are you expecting? So we want to make sure that we aren't imposing a ceiling on those tasks. We are making sure that there is that room for growth and stretch that every child can find that point of challenge. The next one is to recognize how provisional our learning is. That our learning changes and our understanding changes with time, it changes with experience. So this could be contrasted with um, you know, kind of naive notion that most students have, and there's a grain of truth to it, but most students would have the notion, well, learning is just accumulating more knowledge. You just know more stuff and you just kind of pack on more and more stuff. Now, there's certainly a truth to that. As we go through life, as we go through school, we do learn more stuff. But when we learn more stuff, our thinking also fundamentally changes, our understanding changes. So to recognize the transformative and ongoing nature of learning. The next one, that learning is an active process. So you can't sit back and expect learning to happen to you you have to bring yourself to the learning. So again, cultivating those skills of the active learner, being able to question and inquire and bring themselves to the learning. We all bring our prior knowledge, our prior understanding, our prior experience to every learning situation that we have, and we build on that. And the last one here is recognizing the important role of questions. We've gotten pretty good as teachers around the world, thinking about questions as driving inquiry. So we have you know, guiding questions, big questions, essential questions, um, inquiry questions, through line questions. We also, though, need to get comfortable with questions being outcomes of learning, of recognizing that it's not just answering the questions, but f as we go through that learning process, that new questions emerge, and to recognize that ongoingness of learning. You know, there's a quote, I'm just kind of paraphrasing here from Voltaire, that says something to the effect of, don't assess someone's understanding based on the answers they give you. Evaluate their understanding based on the questions they ask you. And if you think about it, the questions our students ask, or the questions anyone asks, are actually a really good barometer 
of their level of understanding. So to get students used to that questions are not only the drivers of learning, but they are also the outcomes of our learning. So when these kinds of messages are sent, this is one of the markers of what a culture of thinking is. So we could say that we, culture of thinking is not about a set of practices that one employs, but a culture of thinking exists when those messages are really a part of the classroom. So to get that sense of what a culture of thinking looks and feels like. Now the actual definition that we use in our project about a culture of thinking is this, to recognize that cultures of thinking are places. So they don't, aren't necessarily schools or classrooms, although we certainly want them to be. But they also can be museums. They also can be the family unit. They can be any group that comes together where learning is a core part of what that group is doing. That group can be a culture of thinking. So cultures of thinking are places in which a group's collective as well as individual thinking is valued, it's visible, it's actively promoted as part of the regular day-to-day -day experience of all group members. So you see those three kind of key action words, the idea that thinking is going to be valued that it's going to be visible, and that we want to make it actively promoted. And the very tail part of that definition, to recognize this is not a one-off activity. We can't do this just on occasion. It has to be part of the day-to-day -day experience. And the last thing I would draw your attention to there, in the very end, it says, of all group members. So there was a time, particularly a time in the US, where we sent students to think to a special room down the hall with a special teacher that we thought thinking was just for the gifted and talented. Now we recognize, and particularly as we embrace this idea that learning is a consequence of thinking, then thinking is for every student. And around the world with the schools we have worked with, what teachers have told us is that when they strive to make this a reality, when they strive to turn their classrooms into places where thinking is valued, visible, and actively promoted, then they say the landscape of the classroom changes. That students that used to not have a voice begin to find a voice, begin to make contributions to class. Because when you change the message, when school is no longer about the quick right answer, but school is about the ideas, the questions, the way you're making sense and developing your understanding, then those students with some academic problems now find a voice in those classrooms. So if that's the story that we want to be telling as a culture of thinking, we ask ourselves, well, how is it that we deliver those messages? How is it, because we don't stand up, you know, day one of school and tell our kids, you know, learning is a consequence of thinking, uh, occurs at the point of consequence. You know, it's not through the direct delivery of that. The way that we tell and send these messages are through what I call the cultural forces. And these eight cultural forces came from that early study I mentioned at the very outset, the study of excellent teachers, of analyzing what they did and understanding that they were leveraging these eight forces to create the culture. So the first one are routines and structures. So all classrooms have routines and structures. If you've ever been a substitute teacher and you ask kids to do something, you know, the first thing you'll hear is, no, that's not the way we do it. You know, there are specific ways that every classroom operates. And one way that you can think about what a routine is, a routine can be thought of as, this is how we do things here. Those are what routines are. At the beginning of school, we develop a lot of those routines. And we develop routines around how do you line up? How do you raise your hand? How do you have conversations? We also develop the routines for learning and for thinking for students. Time. Time is the single most precious commodity that we have as human beings. It's a very precious commodity in all schools and classrooms. So the way that we choose to allocate that time is sending messages to our students about what we care about and what we value. So when a student asks a question, we say, no, no time for that, got to go on. We are implicitly sending the message, my agenda, getting through the material is what's important. Your question, your curiosity is less important. So the way that we are allocating time. 
Next one, the opportunities. Now, the language that we often use to talk about what we do as teachers is we often use the language of, you know, we have lessons, we have activities, we have units, we have plans, we have tasks, we have work. But what we really create as teachers is we create opportunities. So the opportunities that are present in any group are key cultural forces in sending messages again about what's important. Modeling. Now, we're very familiar as teachers with instructional modeling. And instructional modeling is when you stand in front of a group and you say, you know, now watch me, I'm going to show you how to do something. And instructional modeling is really important, very useful. But as a cultural force, it is the modeling of who we are as a thinker and a learner that is most important. That kind of modeling you can't turn on and off. You are always modeling for your students. The next one, the interactions and the relationships that get built from those interactions. So the ways that teacher interacts with the student, the way that students interact with one another, again, a very telling cultural force. The next one, the physical environment. So the way a room is set up, you know, whenever there's a conference that's held at a school, particularly when schools are in session in the middle of the year, one of the things that teachers love to do is to roam the halls and to peek into classrooms. Even when the kids aren't there, even when the teacher isn't in the room. And why is that? It's because we can tell a lot about the learning that happens just by the physical space, the way the room is set up, what is up on the wall, is the process of learning captured. So all of the ways about environment are sending messages to our students. Language. This morning, again, Art Costa talked about the language of thinking and how important that was, certainly important. But language operates on an incredibly subtle, powerful level. And sometimes we aren't even aware of the power of language. So for example, something as simple as a teacher's use of pronouns. Does a teacher talk about our learning, what we are going to do? So you can use inclusive pronouns, we, our, us, together. Or you can use more distancing and controlling pronouns. What I want you to do, your job is, your task is, and create that distance and control. And it's not that you don't use I and you. There are many times when you have to. It's that do you also think in terms of that we, our, us, and the language of community to kind of build that. And the last one here are expectations. Again, that's a very, very familiar word for us as teachers and as educators. We often talk about expectations, and one of the most common ways that we talk about expectations is we talk about our expectation of our students. What do we want from them? I expect you to be on time. I expect your homework to be turned in. I expect you to be quiet. You know, so our expectations of students, again, nothing wrong with that. But we do need to recognize that the expectations of our students are cheap. They don't cost us anything. They're asking what the other person is going to give to us. The kind of expectation that operates as a cultural force is our expectation for our students. What do we want for them? So when we talk about having an expectation for independence, it doesn't mean we're wanting students to come in and automatically be independent. It means that we are going to create those conditions. We are going to support the student in developing that. When we have an expectation for understanding, we create the conditions for that. When we have an expectation for a growth mindset, we create the conditions for that. So when we talk about an expectation for our students, there is a connection and a compatibility there that we are working together to realize those. So these eight cultural forces work together to send those messages. And every student, every student the first day of school, I, I don't care what grade level, I don't care where in the world they are, but I say that every student the first day of school has exactly the same question. And that question is, what is it going to feel like to be a learner here? 
and we answer that question not by what we say, but by what we do. We could stand up in front of a class and say, you know, this is a place where you need to feel comfortable making mistakes. But every student in the room is paying attention to what happens the first time someone does make a mistake. How does the teacher respond? What's their language? What's the interaction like? So we send the messages by not what we say, but how we leverage these eight cultural forces. So another way then that we could define what a culture of thinking is, is to define that kind of operationally. And what that would look like is we could say that a culture of thinking then exists when the cultural forces of that place, when they are aligned with and helping to support good thinking. And here, good is not a value judgment, but good means effective. So three kind of prime reasons why we think. We think to understand, we think to solve problems, we think to make decisions. So good thinking is thinking that is effective in doing those tasks. So when we align those cultural forces, so what would that mean? So all of those eight cultural forces already exist, and in fact, the good news is that when you go back to your schools, back to your classrooms, you don't have to insert any of those eight cultural forces. And by the same token, you can't take any of them out. You can't decide, you know, for the rest of the year, no more interactions for me. You know, it's not going to work. I'm just not going to use language. It's not going to work. So your only question is, how will you leverage those? So we can think then about time, making sure that we give time for thinking. Expectations, okay? So do we communicate our expectations for thinking? Do our students know what kind of thinking that they are to be doing in our class? Modeling, the modeling of who we are as a thinker and a learner, the modeling of thinking from other students. One of the powers of making thinking visible is that it provides a model for students about what thinking looks like. Um, interactions. Now, it's possible that you might think, well, what do interactions have to do with thinking? And yet, to my mind, interactions are core to our relationship with students. Thinking is really at the center there because what we want to do as a teacher is to show an interest in and a respect for students' ideas and their thinking. And when we do that, when we show students that we are interested in their thinking, we get so much more from them. That's when the student really blossoms right before our eyes. You know, one of the things that we have the ability to do as human beings is to read micro-expressions. And students can do this from a very young age. They can tell, is the adult, is this other person interested in what I have to say? And as soon as they detect that you aren't really interested in what they have to say, they switch over and they begin to play the game, guess what's in the teacher's head? And they begin to guess what you want to hear rather than communicating their thinking. So when we show that interest, we get so much more from them. Again, that language of thinking. Are we, we use that language to help us notice and name the thinking which is going on. So even from a very young age, students make a contribution. We can say, ah, oh, that's an interesting connection. That's a great theory. The student doesn't have to have that language, but through our noticing and naming, we are helping to develop that language. The other thing that's so important about noticing and naming is that as a teacher, whatever it is you notice and name, you are reinforcing. So when you notice and name, only correct answers, that's right, that's good. We are reinforcing pleasing the teacher. We are re reinforcing giving the correct answer. But when we begin to notice and name the thinking, we are reinforcing the thinking, and you get more of that. This is one of the reasons why new teachers are kind of warned against noticing and naming bad behavior. Because when you notice and name bad behavior, you are inadvertently calling attention to it and reinforcing it. Instead, what you want to notice and name is the behavior which you are after, calling attention and rewarding that. The next one, again, the opportunities to make sure that we create those opportunities for students to think. 
that we use thinking routines and develop routines that help to support students' thinking. And finally, the idea of the environment, that we have an environment in, this is something that you know, elementary, primary classrooms and teachers have been pretty good at for a long time. They've been pretty good at kind of capturing the products of learning and the products of thinking. But what, one of the things we've learned from the Reggio Emilia preschools is how important it is to capture the process of thinking, to make sure that what is up on the wall isn't a static display of what we learned, you know, one week, one month ago, but instead an ongoing capturing of our learning and our thinking and that it has that kind of dynamic quality to that. So all of these eight cultural forces, looking at them through the lens of thinking to kind of build that culture. So to kind of wrap up here, think about kind of why this matters, why it matters that we create that culture of thinking. And one reason, again, is to go back to those dispositions, those residuals we were after. Those things can't be directly taught, so we have to enculturate them. So if we care about the habits of mind, if we care about 21st century skills, if we care about the dispositions, we have to figure out not how are we going to directly teach those, but how will we leverage the culture to send the messages that those are important and to support the learner in the development of those dispositions. And the last reason here about why it's so important is to recognize that if we are going to change education, we can't merely focus on the curricular content and the instruction. And in fact, around the world, what policymakers do when they want to improve education is they change the curriculum. It's happening in the US, it's happening in Australia. It happens kind of on regular cycles, generally around every seven to 10 years. Countries will revamp their curricula, led by policymakers. And what they're doing there is I think it comes from a very, very naive place, place. And that naive place is policymakers tend to think that all teachers do is deliver curriculum. And I like to say that teachers don't so much deliver curriculum is they enact curriculum. They enact that with their students in that culture. And a lot of times university folks, when they want to improve education, they begin to focus more on instructional methods. Both of those things are really important, but if we are really going to transform education, we have to keep in mind this third part of a three-legged st stool, the instruction, the curriculum, but also the culture. I would say that any curriculum, good or bad, is going to sink or float based on the culture of that classroom. So leveraging that culture will help us to move our students ahead, to help us to develop them as thinkers, to help us move them into the world we want, and to help us better respond to that question, what do we want the students we teach to be like as adults? So thank you. <laughs>